When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. This week, can Apple actually help improve mental health? But first, I'm Quinn Emmett, and this is important, not important, science for people who give a shit. The newsletter features the most important science news, how to think about it, and what the hell you can do about it. You can hit subscribe right now uh, in your feed. You can get these and my conversations with the world's smartest people every single week. Uh, you can also find the email version and links to everything at importantnotimportant.com or write in your show notes. This was originally published on June 16th, 2023. And here's your weekly action step. We had just one. LGBTQ plus youth are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers. You can help the Trevor Project build a safer, more inclusive world through crisis services, peer support, education, and advocacy. Happy Pride. And now, today's big question. How are you feeling about everything? So, in my mind, bedrooms are for two things. One is sleeping seven to eight hours a night, and two is reading seven minutes of a fantasy novel before I pass out. Accomplishing both of these on a pretty frequent basis is the single most vital piece of my mental health. It sounds ridiculous, but it works. And the key way to make sure I accomplish them is by banning screens from the room, specifically phones, specifically in our home and probably yours, iPhones. Which is ironic because the company that makes those, Apple, just announced they're going to improve our collective mental health. Not just me, not just you, everybody. And all it requires is checking in with your phone multiple times a day over the week over the month, over the year. So some additional context, of course. I'm extremely historically privileged. Relative to nearly everyone that has ever lived, um, I have an incredibly small number of things uh, to be stressed or anxious or even depressed about. I have a robust immune system and healthcare. I went to excellent public schools and college. I've worked for amazing people. My wife is wildly and deservedly successful and an incredible partner and mom. Um, I have seen and relied upon an excellent therapist for years. I have time to uh, meditate. I'm able to exercise. It's absurd. And yet, I'm still up, like clockwork, at 2 a.m. almost on the dot, most nights worrying about everything. So what happened? Two weeks ago, Apple announced an integrated suite of improvements to their health platform, coming in beta form this summer and for real this fall, supposedly. Among those is a unified set of disparate apps to help improve your mental health. So how does that work? Includes a journaling app, a mood tracker, and a trend report, like the current ones in health or fitness apps you may use or may ignore, and standardized psychological questionnaires. Now, to be clear, none of these things are actually new ideas. Apple very rarely introduces entirely new ideas or products, usually coming to the game fairly late and improving the user experience with vertically integrated hardware and software, right? So sometimes that means using their unparalleled scale to crush the hopes and dreams of smaller companies that have been doing the thing or making the thing for years now, or sometimes they just buy those companies outright. Sometimes Apple's version is less good, like Maps was. Sometimes it's an upgrade, now or later. Sometimes it's not great and gets better along the way. So examples are like Apple Maps, again, uh, 
Apple Watch, Apple TV, pages, AirPods, password storage, numbers, all that stuff. History is just littered, the past 20 years at least, with Apple's own take on a product or service or category. And now they're coming for your mental health. So should you be excited that the most powerful technology company that's ever existed is trying to solve our mental health epidemic with an annual software update? Should you be excited that an enormous company whose C-suite is 90% 65-year-old white men still, whose first attempt at health tracking didn't include menstruation, is trying to solve mental health? The same company that made the magical device that played host to the social media platforms and tracking cookies that shredded our politics, our privacy, and the exact same mental health these past 16 years, especially the past seven. The same company that later obliterated the tracking technology and, and business models of those same social media platforms to protect your privacy, only to recreate the business for themselves. The same company who designs nearly every device I use to research and write and record and run this business, track my exercise, stream my TV shows, my wife's TV shows. The same company that creates untold waste by releasing new versions of perfectly fine products multiple times a year, but encouraging you to enroll in their trade-in upgrade program, of which I'm part of. The same company who sources their mythical, incredible, self-designed processors from the most contested island nation in the galaxy. I don't know. But without going too far down the rabbit hole, I'm going to use this essay, as it were, to try to work out my own feelings about it. Because our mental health is in tatters for a huge variety of reasons. And there's very little evidence that our current setup, underbuilt, unaffordable, inaccessible, fractured, stigmatized, is capable of turning the ship around. And it, when times are changing irrevocably, access to our most basic needs have become needlessly more complicated. And our brains, like the porous limestone underpinning the entirety of Miami, we're not meant to carry this load. So let's take a step back into 2019. Just a few months before the pandemic really hit, Tim Cook, the most powerful CEO in the world, who'd most recently overseen the development, supply chains, release, marketing, and sales of a watch that didn't really have a market to even fit into, said, Apple's greatest contribution to mankind will be about health. Fascinating. Now, I think Cook learned his lesson after trying and failing to make the watch a luxury fashion item a few years before. I, of course, bought it right away. Not because of fashion, but because it was a new thing. Tim Cook, a gay man from Alabama, has made clear he is acutely aware of his place in the health landscape. In 2014, five years before the quote above, and after years of rumors, Cook came out. So, Again, going back in time a little bit, in an open letter, he described how he was reading letter after letter from kids who were struggling with their sexual orientation. They were depressed. Some said they had suicidal thoughts. Some had been banished by their own parents and family. And he said, it weighed on me in terms of what I could do. Obviously, I couldn't talk to each one individually that reached out. But you always know if you have people reaching out to you that there's many more that don't that are just out there wondering whether they have a future or not, weathering, wondering whether life gets better. And from there, I really decided. So, yes, while Tim Cook once literally signed my wife's paychecks, I clearly do not know the man. He may be among the wealthiest and most powerful people on the planet, but I think when Tim Cook, an avid athlete, says health, he doesn't just mean the watch and padded bike shorts anymore, at least. So before I talk about the next thing, I want to make something clear here, especially if you're new. I come from the Churchill school of give it to the people straight and then try to give them a reason to believe we can pull through this, if not excel. Obviously, immeasurably less eloquent verse, and I don't really do baths. Anyways, let's set the landscape. Deep breath here. One pandemic, one devastated frontline healthcare workforce, Two to five rounds of vaccines and boosters, 23 to 30 million estimated global excess deaths, at least that many nose swabs, tens of millions destabilized or disabled, most of them specifically targeted by Instagram ads for telehealth companies that didn't exist a week ago, 
a couple terrifying elections and Supreme Court cases, a few hundred school shootings, a couple additional tenths of a degree in warming, five to eight percentage points of inflation and a few years off our life expectancy, hundreds of book titles banned, uh, some fires, some flooding, and basically no immigration later, our collective mental health is markedly less robust, <laughs> as you'd expect. Our mental health is either a 18th century sailing ship hopelessly lost in the fog some of the time, or a sack of feral cats hissing at each other between our ears. I know I go back and forth. But some of us are working from home more often, so that's a plus. Or is it? So before we get into how and why Apple might make a contribution to mankind by way of health, I want to understand something first. Who's the market? Who among us might actually benefit from Apple's well-considered software update? Well, to start with, everyone. Feeling sick or under the weather and not having paid leave for yourself or to take care of your kids sucks. Sometimes it's you need it because of a pandemic or because of the flu or menstruation or literally whatever. No matter what, being sick in any capacity costs each of us our energy, but it also costs us money too. All of us. It's incredible in a country that worships quarterly growth above all else that we don't pay people not to come to work when they're sick, when and where they will inevitably get more people sick and cost the economy enormous sums of money. Now, sure, you're saying the work from home revolution helps quite a bit here, right? Offices are emptying out. Most hourly workers actually can't work from home because they're servicing you or making food or any of those things. So that's not surprising. This is the same country that continues to subsidize fossil fuel production, knowing it makes the air toxic, which makes people sick, and then they miss work or school. The same country that subsidizes fossil fuels, knowing it heats the oceans, which makes storms more frequent and more wet, which destroys communities, requiring billions in rebuilds, and people go broke and they get sick and, and, and they miss work. So to close that out, The Lancet, as reported by Harvard Business School, claims that depression and anxiety alone cost the global economy a cool trillion dollars a year. So I don't necessarily think that Apple's new mental health tools will have that or solve disaster relief, but maybe anything helps. Now imagine this. You're sick at home, or your kid is, and your iPhone gently nudges you to rate your emotions at this very moment. How might that act feel? How might it become a habit? How might you describe your emotions and mood differently once you're back at work? or when you can put your kid back on the school bus again. Again, this is not a new idea. Other apps and services do it. But the potential scale is what's key here. Next group, young people. First off, young people buy, or someone buys for them, iPhones. Why? Well, there's the blue bubbles versus green bubbles thing, but that horrifying and artificial social division aside, let's talk about the devastating effects of social media instead. Bernie Sanders, the youngest old person on the planet, wrote an op-ed in The Guardian recently detailing the state of young people for whatever reason. Uh, from his post, 40% of people report being either extremely or very worried that their child is struggling with anxiety or depression. Nearly one out of every three teenagers in America reported that the state of their mental health was poor. Two out of every five teenagers felt persistently sad or hopeless. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 15 to 24 in the United States. Nearly 20% of high school students report serious thoughts of suicide, and 9% have actually made an attempt to take their lives. 32% of teen girls said that when they felt bad about their bodies, Instagram made them feel worse. More than 40% of Instagram users who reported feeling unattractive said the feeling began on Instagram. About 25% of teenagers who reported feeling not good enough said it started on Instagram. So, there you go. Now let's talk about people of color and LGBTQ plus young people. COVID was overwhelmingly more dangerous and deadly to people of color. Marginalized people are more likely, we know this, to live near fossil fuel facilities and on hot, red-lined city blocks, to breathe wildfire smoke, have dirty water, sometimes all those. That's no way to grow up, to try to sleep, to try to go to school. 
Here's a quote from GLAAD CEO Sarah Kate Ellis uh, to Axios. She said, the social media companies are directly responsible for the uptick in hate and violence on the LGBTQ community. She pointed to more than 160 documented acts or threats of violence at LGBTQ events so far in 2023. And look, there are pros and cons to every generation, from the greatest generation right on down. But a lot of the shit our kids are growing through is our fault. We know young people can thrive with purpose, then we fault or fail them when they find some or get up the nerve to post about it. What the hell are we doing here? Even if every single state passes a youth social media law, kids aren't going to give up their phones. I mean, neither are you, neither am I. So we should absolutely minimize how much we use them especially around our families, by modeling good behavior, however old your kids are. Imagine then, again, a cohort of students, after more than a decade of double-tapping on Instagram vacation photos, dragging themselves out of that toxic web by quickly and frequently rating their emotions instead after a long day at school, gaining a better understanding of how they feel on certain days with those trend reports, and maybe even some indication of why. I wish I'd had that. As much as I, I don't wish we had had phones back then, I'm glad we didn't. But of course, some kids aren't in school at all, as enrollment declines across the country. And it's easy to blame the pandemic for fewer kids in school, right? We're still arguing about that. It was a pandemic and we pulled them all out and then got mad at each other. But a quick calendar check shows that kids in high school, middle school, and most of elementary school were born before COVID. Of course, that doesn't mean some of those kids didn't lose a caregiver in COVID or even earlier because we have atrocious maternal health care. Even for the former fastest woman in the world, a black woman who died last month. These kids might even be suffering because the GOP has made no free lunch a fucking political platform. So are Cupertino designed meditation bubbles going to make all that go away? No, they are not. But we can do better here. Let's talk about parents. Sure, we got nice unemployment numbers. But again, there's still no guaranteed paid leave or sick leave, much less for hourly workers. And if you can find reputable preschool or childcare with insurance, you almost certainly can't afford it. Federal Democrats and Republicans alike abandoned the quickly successful child tax credit, even if some states have now picked it up. And so, yeah, it's not too hard to wonder why fertility rates are in the can. And it's now been a year since the Dobbs ruling, so, you know, you can do the math on that one. Now let's talk about healthcare workers, teachers. Why call out healthcare workers in particular? Have you been to a doctor or hospital recently? They're shredded, fucking shredded, drastically understaffed, burnt the hell out, working for profit while their hospital is in the red, and, and sometimes even held for cyber ransom. Again, you can sub in teachers or any other underpaid frontline profession here, like childcare, but here's the thing. Doctors have been suffering something called moral injury since way before COVID, which is a condition traditionally uh, seen in a soldier who's seen or taken part in something that, quote, transgressed their core values, end quote. For a while now, that's been doctors and nurses who've had to extract profit from every patient, no matter how sick, and now, when we're already massively short on nurses, many of them are just quitting. How could they benefit? Let's talk about older people. Loneliness, the quiet pandemic. As U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murphy wrote in the New York Times recently, quote, loneliness, like depression, with which it can be associated, can chip away at your self-esteem and erode your sense of who you are, end quote. Throughout the world, as fertility rates fall and tens of millions in the boomer generation barrel into their, is it Alzheimer's stage? More and more people are more alone than they've ever been. Last month, uh, the Surgeon General's office released a report on loneliness in America and from NPR. Quote, about half of U.S. adults reported experiencing measurable levels of loneliness. Half. The physical consequences of poor connection be devastating, including a 29% increase risk of heart disease, a 32% increased risk of stroke, and a 50% increased risk of developing dementia for older adults. But of course, loneliness uh, isn't regulated to boomers, relegated to boomers, as young people we just had talked about replace 
uh, IRL interactions with online ones, trading more online relationships for poorer ones. Good news, Apple also just built a futuristic computer you can strap to your fucking retinas that will either be very good or very bad for this particular societal and psychological condition. But until then, again, imagine for a moment, again, knowing there's trade-offs to absolutely everything and the current system is failing, imagine your aging parents gently encouraged or trained, if we have to say it, to check in with themselves every day, even just most days. And did you know, you can even share, and again, please be very careful with this feature, you can share portions of your health data, including trends with them, and, and they can do that with you in return. And maybe, again, trade-offs to everything, maybe by doing this, they'll scroll Facebook a little bit less. So how do we get to where we are? How did we make it this far? Well, we all know about talk therapy. It began sometime in the 1800s, and if you can find the right person, and if you can afford it, it can work wonders. Now, the data is so-so. It's not for everyone. I can personally attest that having someone you can say almost anything to, with zero strings attached, can be immensely helpful. But despite the best efforts of shady telehealth companies, it doesn't really scale. We don't have the people for it. And again, the data is so-so. And decades of psychology studies have come under fire after attempts at replication failed down the line. Now, that doesn't mean psychotherapy doesn't work. There are many members in the psychotherapy business uh, profession in my family. They're amazing. They help people all the time. But it just means we need to be honest with ourselves that it doesn't work for everyone and that we don't know why or why not. And I don't want to hear any of the hard science versus soft science Twitter boy bullshit. The same people, usually guys, who shit on psychology and anthropology and ethics and philosophy, again, usually on Twitter, are, are the same ones who've spent the past 15 years using behavioral science, all those fields combined, basically, to get you to, to click on ads, basically. So fuck those guys, truly. Anyways, um, how else have we helped ourselves? Marijuana, which is great, by the way, is still classified wrong, and where it's legal, the markets are mostly in shambles, and so research is way behind as well. Psychedelics research for PTSD and others has more supporters right now since MK Ultra, which you should look up, um, but will some combination of a broken FDA and an ancient Congress bring it into the 21st century? I don't know. You should donate to run for something. And of course, there's uh, SSRIs. Recent studies have controversially repeal, revealed more publicly uh, what many professionals already believed, which is we aren't sure if depression is actually caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain, which means we don't really know if SSRIs really help with depression and if and when they do, how they do that. I won't go into all the other fucked up stuff we used to do to people with mental health conditions, but it's safe to say we need better data. We need more data and we need better tools to get it. So why can't we get there? And what the hell is Apple trying to do? So first of all, um, congratulations for making it this far. Um, I said I wasn't going to go down the rabbit hole, but here we are. So let's set some final context. Again, there are basically two competing phone operating systems on planet Earth. Blue Bubbles, Apple's iOS, as they call it, and Green Bubbles, so Android, across a bunch of manufacturers made by Google. Okay, the data. In 2021, there were at least 3 billion Android devices in the wild, many of which are outside the US. So for now, forget about those for the rest of the article. Meanwhile, Apple claimed this year that there are over 2 billion active Apple devices, active ones. So I think we can safely assume that iPhones are the majority of those, probably followed in order by watches, iPads, and Macs. My hypothesis is this as far as the data we're going to get here. A very small percentage of an enormous number is a big fucking number still. So how do, we, how do I get there? Well, every year within six months of release, which they've done like 15 times now, 70 to 90% of active iOS devices, again, there's about 2 billion, upgrade to the newest operating system. So if we assume iOS 17, which is the next to come this fall with this new mental health toolkit, say it releases in September, like usual, to 2 billion devices, uh, then by spring 2024, 
70%-ish of the active devices, or about 1.4 billion devices, will be on iOS 17 and have access to some version of those tools. Now, many of us have more than one Apple device, so let's be ridiculously conservative and say half of that 1.4 billion on iOS 17 is our working number of actual unique people with a device, active device on iOS 17 by this fall. So again, very conservative. 700 million people. Now let's be brutally more conservative. Let's say just 1% of those 700 million people use the new mental health tools. That's 7 million people across the world suddenly enrolled in the largest mental health study of all time. 7 million people. Compared to 2 billion, or 1.4 billion, or even 700 million, it's small potatoes. But if you know anything about clinical trials, 7 million people is a lot. And that's why these numbers could be very different if even 2% use it. Or on the other hand, if China bans the use of the mental health tools because fucking whatever. Anyways, even if literally nothing else comes from all this data, even if we were tap, tap, swipe, swiping the iPhone mental health equivalent of a crosswalk button that isn't plugged into anything, some research has shown that literally just reflecting on your own mental state can help build emotional awareness and maybe even some resilience. Now, of course, you, you might say, yes, you just said a bunch of research can't be replicated, and I'd say, correct. But I'd also say, does it make sense to you, in your gut, that paying better day-to-day -day attention to how you feel might help a little? Maybe. So can we get the bare minimum of 7 million people or more to do that every day? What about more? Again, this isn't all brand new. Apple's health app has been around for about nine years. The Apple Watch, nearly that long. The health app uh, has got over, I think, like 150 types of information it can collect, and in many cases, distribute to your doctors, including standardized physical and mental health questions through their health kit stuff I've been answering for years. And yeah, outside the health kit, uh, provides other apps and services access to that data, and you should give permission, and you should be very fucking careful about who you give that permission to. It gives, it enables them to uh, connect with electronic health records for building clinical trials and more. And coming back to what we talked about it a bit here and there, that part about clinical trials is actually really important. It's so important I had a whole podcast conversation about it. You can go back and find that. Clinical trials are a mess. They are wildly expensive, homogenous, often uh, geography limited, however you say that, among many other issues. Racist, sure, sexist, yeah. Which is to say, yeah, 7 million compared to 2 billion active devices or 1.4 billion on iOS 17 after it comes out. Again, and not a lot. But a minimum of 7 million Apple users, which obviously is a specific demographic group until themselves, but those 7 million people suddenly reflecting on their individual mental health and building this collective treasure trove of data could be a paradigm shift for the mental health field, and maybe for all of us. So, quick PSA, by the way. Apple's built an entire reputation on protecting your privacy. I hope you're asking this question. And it doesn't entirely hold up. But it does hold up better than most of these tech providers. On the other hand, I wouldn't trust Amazon with this kind of data for a bazillion dollars. So, can Apple solve mental health? Absolutely not. But what does that even mean? Will they try to squeeze every dollar out of it? Probably. The only other company in history this big and with these margins is an oil company who tries to convince you that that's the only option and that it's good for you. So, you know, the point is I'm glad they're trying. That's what I've come to. Because nothing else is working at scale, and we have just dug the hole even deeper the past few years, and with the social media and, and screen experience. I love technology. But I am also extremely ambivalent about supporting Silicon Valley's attempts or ability to fix anything, considering everything they've broken along the way. They've also made some really amazing shit. Apple, an incredibly imperfect 
nation state, basically, really isn't just Silicon Valley anymore and hasn't been for a long time. The offices are still there, even if they're empty, and the foundation of Silicon Valley is still there. Again, it's still mostly run by boomer white men. But if climate change is the heat on our backs, the air we struggle to breathe, and the water that's becoming harder to find, Apple is what's in our pockets, in our ears, on our wrists, and in front of our faces all day, every day. It is what it is. Can all this data mash together with your location and photos and physical health indicators, vertical integration, hopefully, hopefully, secure it as securely as possible, but also standardized and anonymized enough for some not evil algorithm to find some sort of signals and trends and unlock our ability to better assess who the hell is already suffering, who might be dealing with heavy shit now or soon, what are the lowest common denominator treatments that help the most people, or maybe even what works for you specifically, all because you just tap, tap, swipe, swipe to tell it whether a suggested lifestyle modification actually helped? I ask you this, what if it can? And of course, what if it can't? Here's the good news. And I think this is going to be integrated as well. There's a hell of a lot more we can do right now for ourselves and for each other. We can give a shit about each other. First off, if you are suffering or thinking of harming yourself, please call or text 988 right now for help. Please know you are loved. There is so much more we can do right now if we're able. We know what works. Number one, exercise. We know exercise. Even just walking, I fucking love walking, can help actually fight off dementia. It might have the risk of developing clinical anxiety and make us more resilient. A single run or roller skating or whatever alters almost 10,000 molecules in our blood. I didn't know there were 10,000 molecules at all. There you go. Relationships. More to come on this. The legendary 85-plus-year Harvard study of adult development, uh, popularized in the Good Life book, again, more on that very soon, incorporates every kind of reputable method you can imagine, including, and importantly, studies outside of their own. Most importantly, it's their prospective, not retrospective work, that is most effective. Questions about right now. And again, that's literally what Apple's going to be doing. That type of data matters more and more over time and over increasingly numerous and diverse populations and circumstances. And while the, that study's findings are extremely nuanced, one of the highest signal benefits to a good life, healthy, nourished life, is strong, in real life, fulfilling relationships. And there's other apps. Like I said, Apple's not the first to make this kind of software or market it or try to sell it. I have been using the excellent Day One Journal for a decade, and it's fantastic. Similarly, uh, many people swear by Rooted, the panic attack app. Millions meditate or find some sort of connection or thunderstorm sounds or peace with themselves, with headspace or calm. And there's tons of others. But again, I can't be clear enough about this. Be incredibly, ruthlessly discerning about how, who you give any of your data to here. And of course, understand that what works for other people may not work for you or vice versa, or you really have any data behind it all. Talk to your doctor. And of course, there's organized action. There's obviously no way you were getting out of here without this part. Improving the world around us together, building on the work of everyone who came before it through measurable actions, big and small, compounded over time, and populations, can start to undo a lot of what ails us. Toni Morrison said, the function of freedom is to free someone else. Like I always say, we are here to help you feel better and unfuck the world. We can choose to be hope for ourselves and for others. What the fuck does that mean? Well, climate activist Emily Johnston said, our job is not to feel hope. It's optional. Our job is to be hope, to make space for the chance of a different future for ourselves and others. But being hope takes diligent, present work. Project MIA founder Miriam Kaba said, hope is a discipline. Yeah. We have to acknowledge what we've all gone through, that the coming years are going to be a rough, unpredictable ride. And then buckle the fuck up. After we take care of ourselves, we have to take care of each other directly. 
What do I mean by directly? I'm talking about asking these questions of the people around you every day. How are you? How can I help? You can even throw in an I love you just to keep things interesting. Being hope also means enough with the bullshit, the noise. Future people in need, like tomorrow, have to be able to trust the tools available to them. Every time we sell them out for geolocation data, they're going to trust us even less. We have to put the smack down on new and old health and telehealth companies and stop them from sharing and selling your fucking data. We also have to get to real zero. Not net zero. That's not real. We have to pass real gun laws. We have to tax the shit out of huge trucks. We have to stop wasting so much food. We got to clean our air and water. We have to dismantle and improve support systems for adults and especially kids. Making it safer, more affordable, and providing mental health services in schools, just like some schools have nurses and some do not. We can recognize and rebuild our relationship with nature, paying for what we've destroyed, spending time among birds and in green spaces, and of course building more of those spaces for everyone who doesn't currently have access to them. Look, there's nuance to everything, and lumping everyone's mental health together would be a huge, enormous mistake. But acknowledging the immense scale of our problems and opportunities, from clean energy production to vaccines, hunger, and heat, means breaking it down into the most hands-on examples possible. It's what I try to do every day. Now, I'm not so naive as to think any one of us can cool the ocean back down, nor that any single technology company can solve any single problem, much less one from which they clearly reap the bulk of their historic profits. But I would also be very bad at my job if I ignored the scale of a technology already in the hands of a large fraction of the world's population. Yeah, once Apple used this power and scale to magically shove a free U2 album into your music library. Never forget. But this fall, they're going to try to do one better and help us all feel just a little bit less anxious. That's it for this week. Hit subscribe to get next week's issue straight to your feed. To go deeper, visit importantnotimportant.com. Thanks for being a part of our community, and genuinely, thank you for giving a shit. Have a great weekend.